God of truth and of wisdom, we pray that the word we are about to hear will take root in our hearts and in our minds, and that it will inspire us to live our lives with renewed purpose, hope, and faith. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was to be hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of the Lord. Episcopal priest and renowned preacher Barbara Brown Taylor recalls watching a trio of white crosses spring up on a hillside by the highway. Except, to put it more accurately, they didn't really spring up. Erecting these crosses was a drawn-out task for someone. The first time Barbara drove by, there were just three posts that appeared to be growing out of the ground. The next time she passed, cross beams had been added. A few days later, the crosses were painted white, and then a few days after that, the finishing touch, a purple cloth was draped over the central cross. As Barbara Brown Taylor watched this process unfold, she began to wonder, why not stop with one cross? That would have been a lot less work, would have gone faster, would have gotten the same message across. Why construct three crosses on the hillside? But then she realized something. One cross is not the same message as three crosses. One cross makes a crucifix. Three crosses make a church. All four Gospels agree that Jesus was not the only poor soul hung upon a cross that day. Each of the crucifixion accounts place him between two others, who, like Jesus, were convicted of some crime and sentenced to death. The consistent testimony of the Gospel writers serves to remind Christians 2,000 years later how prevalent crucifixion was in the Roman Empire. 
This gruesome death was not reserved for the savior of the world, far from it. It was reserved for every common criminal, every enemy of the state, rabble-rousers, dissidents, pirates, and thieves, certainly for defeated political leaders and kings, even those whose kingship was the subject of debate, as it was for Jesus of Nazareth. It was not uncommon to see three or even 30 crosses clustered on a hillside or scattered along the road, for crucifixion was all about spectacle. It was a painful, shameful death intended to scare subjects of Rome into submission. So here we are, gazing upon a tragic tableau that seems to be an all too common scene of life and death under the Roman Empire. Except that when we zoom in, when we get close enough to overhear the conversation between Jesus and the two criminals, we discover that this scene is not common at all. While all four gospel evangelists agree that Jesus was not crucified alone, only Luke records a conversation between Jesus and the ones on his right and on his left. The first criminal derides Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. He's not alone in his taunts, of course. The leaders scoff at Jesus. The soldiers mock him. Shaming those condemned to the cross was part of the spectacle, remember? So it is not surprising that the so-called king of the Jews would have to endure such taunting in his final hours even from those suffering the same fate. <clears throat> what is surprising is what happens next. Do you not fear God, says the other criminal? We are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then this condemned criminal looks to the man in the middle, the one hanging under our sarcastic sign that reads, King of the Jews, and he pleads, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is all he asks, to be remembered. He does not ask for deliverance. He does not ask for the suffering to end. When the king of the Jews comes into his kingdom, this man just wants to be remembered. It seems so simple this plea from one suffering a disgraceful, painful death. And yet, isn't this the deep longing of so many in our world today? To be remembered? Is this not the deep longing of those in our homeland who are convicted, sometimes wrongly convicted, as in the case of Christ, and left to rot in a prison cell? Is this not the deep longing of those in Jesus' homeland who still live under occupation and, like their ancestors, suffer the plight of food and security and take every step under the watchful eye of soldiers? Of those who seek a future of freedom and endure state-sanctioned violence? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Is this not the longing of our neighbors who make their homes under overpasses or who move their families from church to church until they can once again afford to keep a roof over their heads? Or of those loved but lost to the grip of addiction who can't seem to break free from the stranglehold of opioids or alcohol? Or of sisters and brothers who are reeling from divorce? or grieving a diagnosis, or feeling deeply disappointed, disoriented in a world once familiar? To some extent, is this not our common longing? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, the one who came to seek and save the lost, responds to the criminal hanging beside him just as he responds to so many throughout the Gospels, he responds with mercy. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
Jesus responds with forgiveness, with compassion, with grace. He responds with love. <clears throat> Time and again, this is the power Christ chooses. He chooses love as he dines with sinners and tax collectors, as he heals a cast-out woman and restores her to community, as he spins stories of a shepherd scouring the wilderness for a single sheep and a parent welcoming the prodigal home. Even now, as he hangs upon a Roman cross, Jesus chooses the power of love. It is a power the world doesn't understand, to the leaders who scoff, to the soldiers who mock, to the criminal who calls upon Jesus to get them out of this mess, it just looks like weakness. It looks like impotence. And yet, it is a power so threatening that the powers that be felt the need to crucify it, to nail the king of love upon a cross as if a death sentence could put an end to the whole thing. But we know just how powerful love is. Three days later, we watch the one who was mocked by the imperial guard make a mockery of empire as he rises victorious from the grave. In that moment and for all time, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords proves that love prevails. In the end, love wins. Here's the thing. If we truly believe this, if we truly believe in the power of love, how does this power rule our lives? This is the question for us today as we celebrate Reign of Christ Sunday. If we claim Jesus, the crucified King, as Lord of our lives, how does this allegiance shape our witness here and now? Well, it seems the conversation we overhear as we stand at the foot of the cross might have something to teach us. It teaches us that a church that professes a crucified king cannot shy away from the suffering of our world, but must respond as Jesus does, with forgiveness, with compassion, with grace. We are called to remember those the world seems to have forgotten, those who have been pushed to the margins and reduced to objects of derision. It teaches that we, that we are set apart as the body of Christ to, empower, excuse me, to embody the power Jesus chooses, the power of love. As we pray and hope and work for Christ's kingdom to come right here on earth, we are sent to extend the promise of Christ. Today you will be with me in paradise. Yes, some will mock us for following a first century radical who was executed by the state. Some will take their cue from the leaders and the soldiers and even that criminal on the cross who scoffed at Jesus because the world still does not understand the power of self-emptying love. The world still sees it as weakness, as impotence, forgetting that love is the only power that ever truly wins. But if we claim Jesus as Lord, then we must lay claim to our calling to practice compassion, to remember the forgotten, to offer a glimpse of paradise even in the midst of pain. If we follow a crucified king, then we must be a crucified church. People who pour themselves out in the name of love for the healing of the world. What was it that Barbara Brown Taylor said? One cross makes a crucifix. Three crosses make a church. Across our nation, across our world, the lost and the least are still pleading, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The question is, how will we respond? Will we point to the, the solitary crosses standing in our sacred spaces and say, Jesus has it covered? <clears throat> or will we take up our crosses and follow the way of self emptying love. 
We know what we're called to do, and thanks be to God, the church is already living into this calling amidst the lost and the least, the forlorn and forgotten. We see it as Christians with organizations like Churches for Middle East Peace listen for the voices of those suffering injustice in our holiest lands and amplify their calls for peace by visiting them, by praying for them, by sharing their stories. The global church assures sisters and brothers living under the threat of displacement and violence and scarcity that they are not alone. In coming alongside them, these disciples echo the promise of Jesus. In Christ's kingdom, you are remembered. We see it at our southern border as baptized believers of different nationalities but common faith gather for worship on either side of the wall. Despite the metal fence running down the center of this multinational congregation, these citizens of Christ's kingdom share communion and pass the peace of Christ by touching their fingertips through the holes in the fence. And as these Christians in Mexico and the United States worship our crucified and risen King together, they proclaim through their witness and work, in Christ's kingdom, you are remembered. And we see it here, do we not? Every time our congregation transforms a classroom into a bedroom so that families without a home have a place to lay their heads until they get back on their feet. And every time our members sit beside children from Urban Promise to help with homework and swap stories and nurture relationships that confound the world. And every time we show up at the retirement home with flowers and communion to remind God's beloved children that the church loves them too. Yes, in all these things we strive to proclaim to anyone who knows that deep longing anyone who has whispered that criminal's final plea, in Christ's kingdom, you are remembered. If we follow a crucified king, then we must be a crucified church, pouring ourselves out for the healing of this world. After all, one cross makes a crucifix, three crosses make a church. May we be a community that responds as Christ does, with forgiveness, with compassion, with grace, and above all else, with love.